Well, good evening, everybody, and um, welcome. I'm Frank Avalon from Lawyers Committee for Better Housing, and welcome to Tenant Thursdays. As you know, Lawyers Committee has a tenants' rights and tenant protection segment every Thursday evening at six o'clock. And tonight, uh, uh, we are working with the Chicago Housing Justice League to explore an exciting new tenant protection bill currently pending before city council known as Just Cause for Eviction. Um, we're gonna have some after uh, introductions of our guests that you can see on the screen. Um, I'm gonna spend maybe five or six minutes doing an overview of the Just Cause for Eviction bill that we have in city council and why it's needed. Then we're gonna hear from two tenants, Geneva Norman and uh, Sharon Parker, who are gonna share with us their life experience of being renters in Chicago. Um, we're gonna kind of throw things open to the panel and, and discuss um, what's going on with neighborhoods and tenants and uh, how to keep neighborhoods stable and to keep people in place. Um, before I would, uh, we get started though, I wanted to point out a couple of resources for everybody. First of all, I do want to mention that if you need legal assistance as a renter, uh, particularly as it relates to eviction or disrepair of your apartment or other tenants' rights matters, uh, feel free to uh, go into the LCBH website, which is lcbh.org. Um, click on our Rentervention app uh, to give us an idea of your problem or just grab that phone number and give us a call. Um, I also want to mention that there's lots of data about eviction by both wards and by Chicago neighborhoods in that lcbh.org website. Just click the eviction portal and you can see what's going on in your neighborhood or your ward uh, uh, about evictions. Um, I also want to point out that um, there's great information about the Just Cause for Eviction campaign and why it's needed and some data relating to that on the Just Cause website. So just go to www.justcausechicago.org and you could see a wealth of information there. That's also where you can click a link to volunteer to be involved in this important campaign. Um, finally, I do wanna mention that on the Facebook portal, we have three handouts for you that you can take a look at. One is a fact sheet on Just Cause for Eviction. A second is a, a two page sheet that shows the connection between health and stable housing. And finally, there is a sheet uh, in the portal that shows you the top 10 Chicago neighborhoods that have the highest rate of evictions. Uh, unfortunately, they are largely African-American neighborhoods, which is why we believe that just cause is a racial equity issue um, and one about neighborhood stability. So throughout the program, if you in the audience have questions or comments, put them in the chat box. We'll see if we can get to them uh, uh, and we'll go from there. So without further ado, um, I want to um, say that we'll meet our attendants later, Sharon and Geneva. And first I want to turn to our panelists and ask them just to give us a, a one minute introduction of themselves and what they do in the universe as it affects tenants. And why don't we start with uh, Juanza Malone? Good evening, my name is Juanza Malone. I'm the executive director at the Kim and Oakland Community Organization. Uh, one of the oldest uh, black led grassroots organizing groups in the city. Uh, we are a founding member of the Lift the Band Coalition. Uh, in our community, we are actively involved in uh, really trying to balance the imbalanced power dynamic that exists between uh, renters and property owners. Uh, so we are actively involved in building tenant councils, uh, working to bring rent control uh, here to Illinois, and working to stop uh, the tidal wave of evictions that's facing us. Excellent. Thank you, Juanza. And uh, let me ask uh, Alderman Cicho Lopez. Introduce yourself, Byron, and uh, tell the folks uh, your connection to renters. Uh, well, thank you for the invitation. Um, again, Alderman Byron Cicho Lopez from the 25th Ward. Um, I was a former director of the Pilsen Alliance, um, serving the board also of the Metropolitan Tenant uh, Organization. I uh, had also the pleasure to be, um, uh, you know, before I was Alderman, also in the leadership of the Leave the Band Coalition, which we continue to support. Uh, now and uh, you know, more than ever, we believe it is important that 
we uh, advocate for the most vulnerable and low income tenants right now are the most vulnerable population across the city of Chicago and across the country. So I'm really, really glad to be in this panel with strong advocates for, for housing justice in our city. Thank you, Alderman. Uh, William, introduce yourself. Tell the folks who you are. William, we can't hear you, so I don't know if there's a technological problem there. And we'll, while we're waiting for that to resolve, um, uh, let's turn to Erica. Erica, introduce yourself to the folks. Hi, everyone. I am Erica Nanton. I am a cultural arts organizer with the National Poor People's Campaign. Um, the Poor People's Campaign is actually uh, was started by Dr. Martin Luther King um, right before he was assassinated. He was moving into organizing poor people across race, across religion, across demographic, all across this country. Um, but unfortunately, his life was taken and a lot of that went to disarray. And so 50 years later, um, people from across this country have come together um, that are poor and directly impacted to stand up and rise up. And uh, I, the, the important piece of that is to not miss the point that the poor, the people being evicted, those who are directly impacted are the very voices and the very power and the very movement that is gonna be needed to move these ideas and move these legislations and move these changes forward. So I'm really happy to be here with all of you today. Thank you, Erica. Uh, John Bartlett, tell the folks who you are. I am John Bartlett. I'm the executive director of the Metropolitan Tenants Organization. And uh, well, one is we have a tenants rights hotline that about 10,000 people call every year to find out what their rights and the laws are. That number is 773-292-4988 if you should need that. Secondly, we also organize tenant associations because we found that when tenants organize together that the landlord is far more likely to listen to you, far more likely to give in to your demands. And that's really a, the, the way to win in a, uh, if, if you're having a group issue. So don't work alone, work together and uh, give us a call if you need help forming a tenants association. Great message, John. William, let's get back to you, my friend. Oh, we still don't have any sound from William. Well, hopefully that works out one way or another here. And um, I guess the disadvantage of all of us staying at home and having to work through technology is that we have these glitches. Um, William, I think you're having a problem with your microphone and um, uh, maybe when you go into the the link at the bottom left-hand corner in your mic, you can get that straightened out. Let us know and um, uh, we'll move on and hear from William hopefully later. Um, okay, I wanna spend a few minutes, uh, maybe five minutes talking about the Just Cause for Eviction Bill, why Just Cause is important so that everybody has the same framework that they're sharing. Um, uh, everything that I'm, I'm going to say here tonight is, is information that are in those flyers that are attached to the Facebook portal, as well as uh, this information is also available at www.justcausechicago.org. Um, so no need to scurry around taking notes. It's all there available for you. <laughs> all right. So um, it's important to understand that in Illinois and in Chicago, a landlord can end the landlord uh, the landlord tenant relationship and force a tenant to move for any reason or absolutely no reason at all as long as they give the tenant advance appropriate advance notice and then file an eviction case against the tenant um, the landlord is allowed to do all this for no reason whatsoever so no fault and no cause terminations account for over 6,000 of Chicago's 24,000 eviction cases filed every year. And indeed, we um, suspect that it is responsible for the displacement of over 10,000 Chicago families every single year. Many people 
abandon their personal property, abandon their household goods, and live doubled up with a friend or a neighborhood when they get a termination notice for fear of dealing with the formal court system and the uncertainties facing them there. So it's probably more like 10,000 families are cut adrift in Chicago every single year like clockwork. Um, we also know, uh, not only from our Chicago experience, from nationwide, that no fault and no cause terminations and evictions are the primary cause of displacement. It's used by gentrifiers, it's used by flippers, it's used by out-of-town venture capital firms to clear buildings and clear blocks. Um, and unfortunately, there are some landlords that will use a no fault or no cause termination as a way of hiding racial discrimination or as a way of hiding retaliation uh, when they want to get rid of a renter who's complained about the condition of the property or who has asked for repairs to be done. In short, what Just Cause does at its heart is it puts a stop to no fault and no cause evictions, no fault, no cause terminations, and no fault, no cause non-renewals. It says rather, if you want a tenant to compel a tenant to leave their home of two years, five years, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years, and uproot their life, you need a reason. And it's gotta be one of the seven reasons listed in this just cause bill. Three of the reasons are traditional tenant fault, non-payment of rent, disturb, disturbing your neighbors, significant breaches of the lease, damaging the property, et cetera. Well-known things that landlords could always ask you to leave for still remain in place. But this bill also allows a landlord to end the relationship for four reasons that have nothing to do with the tenant at all, but are generally considered to be appropriate or reasonable motivations of the landlord. For example, um, condominium conversion, the need to do substantial rehabilitation, or if the landlord wants to remove the property from the market, or if the landlord, particularly small mom and pop landlords, if they need or want to move in a close relative, then that would be a, a, a reason to ask the current tenant to, to move. Close, uh, close relative, let's say a mom and pop landlord has a son or a daughter with minor children that particularly in this time of COVID uh, needs a place to stay and the landlord wants to make that unit available. When the landlord wants the tenant to move for one of these four reasons that have nothing to do with the tenant's fault, then the just cause for eviction bill asks that landlord to help with the transition by paying the tenant some relocation assistance so that that transition is humane and smoother and less chaotic than it would have been. Okay. Um, so just cause is not only a matter of fundamental fairness, it is also a matter of racial equity. Again, look at the sheet that we've posted. The top 10 neighborhoods in Chicago out of the 77 neighborhoods that are most afflicted by evictions and displacement are African-American neighborhoods. You can see the list right there. There's no uh, surprise. We all know that Chicago has a history of racial segregation and impactment that um, these neighborhoods are frequently disinvested. And when they're not disinvested, people are trying to buy them up. Recent article in the National Realtors um, a magazine suggested that uh, in 2020, Chicago is a great place to come in and buy up investment property, particularly in these African-American neighborhoods. We know that over a 10-year period, 200,000 African-American Chicagoans um, have been displaced from Chicago. Way too many of them were displaced without any cause or any fault of their own. So, um, just cause is not only a matter of racial equity, it is also a matter of health. Uh, you can look at our posting to the Facebook sheet and see that there's a direct connection between housing instability and health, particularly of families, particularly of children and of senior citizens. Um, in essence, the message of Just Cause for Eviction is simply this, that a family ought to be able to lay down roots and remain a member of that neighborhood absent a good or compelling reason for them to move. This is an important piece, but just one piece, but an important piece about neighborhood stability. 
about slowing the pace of displacement affecting Chicago and giving all residents, landlords and tenants alike, a long-term stake in the well-being of their community. Um, I just wanna say, just cause is nothing new, nothing new at all. It's been the law in at least four states in the United States, the entire state of California, the entire state of New Jersey, Washington DC, New Hampshire, Oregon, tens of millions of rental units already live under just cause where those landlords are doing just fine. Thank you. There's also over 20 cities in the United States where just cause is the law. This is a known quantity. It's not uh, something with lots of unknown uh, consequences. So that's a brief description. Again, you can see the materials at the website, justcausechicago.org. Um, and I want to open things up to our panelists a little bit uh, and let us have a conversation. And I want to say to all the panelists, feel free to chime in, whatever you like. Um, I want to first give Bill a chance, uh, William, a chance to at least introduce himself if his microphone is working. William, what do you got? No, still not? Oh, well, hopefully that'll work out. Uh, let me start by at least asking Juanza Malone from Coco. Um, what are you seeing with tenants on the south side of Chicago, uh, Juanza, and what impact do you think Just Cause might have on what you're seeing there at Coco? So we're seeing probably what everybody else around the city and around the state and frankly around the country is seeing right now. Uh, we are uh, experiencing uh, unprecedented uh, levels of job loss, wage loss, uh, people feeling extremely vulnerable, um, systems failing, uh, just completely breaking down is causing undue stress. Uh, and frankly, trauma on top of everything else. Uh, and so we have uh, residents who lived in the community, have worked every single day of their lives, uh, have traditionally paid rent when it was due, have been able to pay their bills, have been able to raise their families. And in this moment, they've been frankly unable to do that. Uh, there are families who simply have been out of work since the governor told people to stay home, uh, told people to shutter their businesses. And in the effort to uh, reduce uh, the spread of the coronavirus, uh, people have stayed home. And when businesses were forced to shutter their doors, uh, people lost wages. Uh, when things began to open back up, all the businesses that shuttered their doors were not able to reopen. Uh, in fact, there are business owners who have literally gone out of business because of the number of months they weren't able to bring in any revenue. And so what we have are basically people who are unable to pay rent and have been unable to pay rent. And so fortunately, there have been local and federal uh, eviction moratoriums that have prevented the legal uh, filing of, and enforcement of evictions but there's still a problem. Uh, one of the problems is that uh, landlords have illegally uh, still filed eviction notices, have served eviction notices, which is just terrify people. Uh, and we also have been seeing uh, the fact that uh, people are hiring third party um, eviction firms to go in and enforce people to leave their properties. Uh, we have seen corporate landlords who receive support from the federal government uh, to keep people in their homes uh, in the middle of a pandemic still move to evict residents. While there's a federal protect, there was a federal protection, while they receive support uh, and relief to ensure families were not kicked out onto the street, they still moved to evict people. Uh, unconscionable. Uh, I'll just say two more things. Uh, we also are seeing um, the, the horrific impact of families having to double up. Again, once the family received a notice, they're harassed by the property owner to leave. 
Um, they flee to move in with a family member or a friend or someone who's willing uh, to provide them with some shelter. And we see uh, the spread of the coronavirus. Uh, it's nothing that uh, should happen. It is entirely preventable. Uh, but again, because uh, we have people uh, who are operating not in good faith uh, and people who are struggling to keep a roof over their head and over the head of their family members uh, are putting themselves at risk. And there are cases where people have um, become infected. And so now they're in this congregate setting right there. You have more people there uh, who would normally be there. And I mean, just imagine uh, what it's like trying to get well and not infect uh, your family members or friends or neighbors. Uh, so it's, it's a huge problem, Frank, as I know you know. Uh, there, is, um, there is hope afoot. Um, the Lift a Band Coalition has been working with groups across the city and across the state uh, to really pressure the governor to do more. Uh, there are some specific demands uh, that we have to, to address that issue. There are residents who are rolling up their sleeves and taking matters into their own hands. And so there is a brigade uh, around the city that has vowed to move people back into their homes uh, if they're forced out into the street. Uh, again, to some degree, that's extra legal. Um, but when you think about the fact that, again, evictions right now are illegal uh, and people should not um, be placed in harm's way, uh, it doesn't leave a whole lot of recourse. Yeah. Uh, and so I'll, you know, stop there. Um, but it's, it's a huge problem that is only going to get worse if we don't act now and if our elected officials don't take this issue seriously. Well, thank you, Juanta. And I know that uh, you're so right in bringing up the things about the, uh, the, the effect of, of, of COVID on the whole situation that's going to last for quite a bit longer. Uh, even before COVID, and certainly after COVID, uh, there's many areas in the near south side where uh, people are facing displacement because of community economic development that is anticipated due to the Obama Center and other reasons why long-term residents are being asked to leave their neighborhoods of their entire lives, though they've done nothing wrong and aren't being allowed to share in the benefit of any development that's to come. And I think that has something uh, uh, feeds into what Alderman Cicho Lopez was uh, seeing in Pilsen as well. So Byron, let me ask you, um, uh, what do you see the situation in Pilsen as being on the ground that led you to push for just cause for eviction to be entered at city council? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you again, I think, uh... Jawans and, and, and the COCO um, and COCO organization and many other organizations that are doing the grassroots work, I think, have seen the effects of um, of, of, of these uh, uh, these uh, these developers and uh, and, and um, the, you know corporations, the super rich, putting their agenda uh, at the expense of the most vulnerable members of our community. So, um, and I think what what we've seen, especially now in the pandemic that the, the pandemic hasn't, hasn't stopped, but I think it, it seems like almost like government is ready to pretend like, it, like the pandemic has gone away, which is a great concern of us. I mean, lifting a moratorium on evictions will have a tremendous effect, not only in the health and well-being of, of residents across the board, but especially um, among African-American and Latino communities where the, the infection rates are the highest the, in, in, in the city. The, the death rates are the highest in the city. So I think we have to be very clear where we will have the most effect. Uh, and we already have developers in particular who have decided to file thousands of evictions, even after they pledge, quote unquote, not to do it, right? So these pledges without legislation, uh, we know go nowhere. And that's what we, you know, we, we've been uh, extremely, um, worry about the lack of action from, from every level of government, uh, state, city, county, federal, and, and, and the need of, of action of the government during these times is critical. What we've seen on the ground, and I think in Pilsen, in, uh, you know, I know that in High Park and many other communities across um, Woodlawn, you name it, uh, we have seen how developers impose their agendas, 
they they write the laws and they have politicians to make sure that the laws are never uh, adjusted or they never change. And there's a great concern because we see the effects of what, um, you know, these bubbles. I mean, we, we, I mean, you will think, right, that we will learn from what happened in 2009, not too long ago, what has happened in every great recession. Uh, and, and we see that developers, banks, corporations speculate and, and they create these bubbles, right, during, during times of crisis that, that burst. And when bubbles burst, we have seen the effects in the most vulnerable, right? So not only on tenants, but also on the small homeowners. So let's be clear, because there's clearly here a, 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 an attempt to pitch, you know, the small homeowners against the tenants and, and vice versa. And we got to understand that these policies affect both of the small homeowners and tenants alike. So in this issue, we must uh, make sure that we, we understand what's at stake here. Uh, I'll tell you that here in, in our community, and the irony, right? The irony of the of the planning uh, uh, departments and, and 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 some agencies, right? That talk about historic preservation and affordable housing and landmarks, right? But they allow to 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 have big developers to come into our community and build big luxury housing on top of it, right? So how do we talk about preservation when you have hundreds of thousands of of luxury unit subsidized by government? which is to add insult to injury, right? We have developers like the 78, we have gotten over $1.3 billion in, um, uh, in subsidies to build luxury housing. And where is the money, where's the relief for the, for, the, for the people, the taxpayers, the small businesses, homeowners and the tenants. So I think that's what we're seeing on the ground, subsidies for the rich and, and the consequences by the poor uh, and the working class, right? So I think that what we what we've seen, you know, at this point, and it's concerning, right? How developers and corporations and the super rich, you know, Ken Griffin seems to have a lot of influence, uh, you know, in city council and Eric Trump and others on real estate interests and the lack of legislation to protect the working people across the city is alarming. I think that what we want, I think, in Pilsen and many other communities, is the stability. Uh, what we want to make sure that we want is a stable homes, a stable neighborhoods, and a stable city. And a speculation of this nature, what it does is destabilizes our communities. I mean, we're seeing communities, I mean, in Chicago alone, 250,000 250, African-American residents have left the city. And we will continue to see this trend if we don't have a clear path towards real growth. I mean, we are talking about developers who continue to build when we have empty and vacant luxury units, thousands of vacancies. Right, but yet they create this false uh, economy, these bubbles that will burst again at the expense of the most vulnerable. What we also have seen in our community is, you know, developers who try to buy their way into our communities, trying to even go as far as, you know, trying to bypass, you know, the the the, the local processes, trying to influence courts. You know, they 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 uh, as and and this is this is a serious concern when the city is in a, in a serious fiscal condition that we allow this to happen with the excuse that we are broke and we need revenue. Well, when we're talking about you know, uh, revenue, we have to talk about the taxpayer and what makes the, 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 the tax base and the backbone of our economy. And that's the small homeowners and that's the small businesses and that's the tenants and the vast majority of Chicagoans. Now there's more percentage of developers who speculate and control our laws and control our city council and Springfield and so on. I'm really worried about what's happening with a property tax assessment as well, because we have to see in a, broker in a broken property tax assessment system, what happens when they speculate, when they are, you know, and, and let's remember these big developers are the first ones who give you the 30 day notice and we have tenants who now are looking for a home. And what we see on top of that is that when they have big development in the nearby blocks, we have an increase of the property tax assessments will affect tremendously the home, the small homeowners that now are complaining and you will talk to our small homeowners that they are paying astronomical uh, property taxes, but yet the big developer, they have maybe a same square footage, pays a, the same, a, same of that. And if they have a good attorney that is connected, maybe even pay less than that. So again, we have to be very, very vigilant about what, what we're trying to do here. So let me now move to what 
um, why uh, uh, just cause is so critical for us because it's important that we mention, I'm just wanna give you a diagnosis of what's going on so rapidly and why we have always advocated not only for the tenants, but also for the homeowners because we are advocating for the working people of Chicago. I think that what we, we, we have to remember is the law that, you know, unfortunately was passed a little too late uh, was the SRO law. And I'd like to, to, to compare it to just cause because it has similar effects. When the SRO law passed to protect single room occupancy buildings, veterans, seniors, uh, low income te uh, tenants, uh, we were able to establish relocation assistance so that developers that were targeting SROs don't come by these properties and evict veterans. And they were effectively here in Pilsen. They're affecting, you know, you know, hundreds of tenants, seniors, veterans without, without any remorse. So when this, the law, unfortunately, by the time that the legislation was passed, we already have, unfortunately, uh, thousands of SRO units that were lost. That's what we were trying to prevent with just cause. We're trying to prevent the loss of affordable housing in the hands of developers that continue to speculate in a market where, and that is already tilted toward their advantage. So we wanna make sure that uh, we continue to advocate for good cause. I mean, we're, we're trying to say, you know, we have tenants and they think these, these ordinances, I think to me are common sense. We're talking about tenants who are doing, who are working hard, who are making ends meet barely, you know, making ends meet, paying check to check, but yet a developer can come tomorrow and say, you know what, I'm gonna buy this property in the, and you have 30 days. That's what we're trying to stop here. We'll be successfully able to pass passing this legislation to protect affordable housing, to protect the small homeowner and the tenant. And that's what we wanna do here. In a time like this, and I wanna end with this, we need to make sure that we have a government that protects the people, protects the homeowner, the taxpayer and the tenant. We are doing, what we're seeing right now is the opposite. We have government that is talking about austerity. We, we see what happened with the relief packages, right? The relief has gone to the super rich and even connected and the big businesses at the expense of the, at, at the, expense of the rest of us, the working people. So what we wanna make sure is that we have a government that passed legislation that is based on good practices. There are, there are dozens of cities that already passed something similar to Just Cause and Chicago should not be the exemption. We gotta remember that in times like this, a strong government, you know, in the Great Depression, only strong government through a new deal, we were able to recover from, from a tremendous uh, depression. That's what we need to do now. Have a strong government that advocates for the majority and not the super rich. And I hope just cause, you know, is that law that we can pass immediately to protect the most vulnerable. Well, thank you, Byron. And um, certainly that's a, a, a broad swap of, of, of a lot of things that we're facing uh, as a city and as a society. Um, I certainly don't envy you being in a decision-making position these days with, with so many things to deal with. Um, before I want to turn to Sharon Parker to share her story with us in just a second, but I do want to comment um, that a just cause, uh, uh, from what Byron mentioned, uh, will certainly have the effect of slowing the pace of no fault and no cause termination, slowing things down to give communities and individuals a greater opportunity to participate in decision making about their own neighborhoods. And that's pretty important stuff when it comes to stability. Also, when we talk about COVID, we need to understand that not only are there anticipated to be hundreds of thousands of evictions filed when the moratorium's lifted, most of those are gonna be for non-payment of rent. But, but we also have to realize that like with the financial crisis in 2008 through 2012, for the next two years or more, we're going to see uh, landlords, big, small and medium sized landlords that are gonna be in financial distress from the COVID syndrome. And they're gonna face foreclosures and bankruptcies. And some of them are just gonna sell out to venture capital firms on Wall Street. And in all of those scenarios of foreclosure, bankruptcy and sell off, those new owners are gonna come in and try to evict and displace people without cause and without fault. And without just cause standing there as a barrier, there's nothing stopping them from doing that. Sharon, Hi. thank you, dear, for waiting so patiently. And um, we'd love to hear, uh, tell the folks who you are and, and what happened with you here in Chicago. Hi, I'm Sharon Parker. I, um, my story is I purchased a home 28 years ago. Um, in 2010, I became 
I was laid off and I 2012, I became ill. So I fell behind um, on some bills and things like that. I fell behind on everything and especially the property tax. So I reached out to my mortgage company and I asked them for help, you know, if they could help me with the property taxes because I was getting letters that I was gonna lose the property and different things like that. So uh, I did a modification and I thought that everything was really taken care of. I really did because I never, you know, been up against evictions or didn't really know how to handle a lot of this. I got a cousin, Nancy Hughes, that helped me with a lot of the things that, you know, helped me kind of learn some of my rights. But anyway, um, Elite Rentals came to me in 2016 and told me that I no longer owned that property and that I could be evicted, that they was gonna evict me out of that. And that really scared me to death because I was really sick, you know, because like I said, I'm, I'm disabled now, I'm on disability. And when he said that, I said, what do you mean? I just did a modification. How do you, what do you mean you own my property? He said, yeah, we own this property and we can have you evicted out of here. And I was like, oh my God. So I said, well, I need to go downtown. I didn't know what I was doing. Went downtown, had them pull my records, you know, and had a guy try and explain to me how did this happen and why did this happen? How has they able to put me out of this house like this? I've been here 28 years. I have nowhere to go, you know? And um, at that time they left me a card. So I called the card and the, 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 the manager, I guess the building owner told me that I could sign a lease with them that I had to pay them rent. So with me having nowhere to go, I had no other choice. Like I said, just hard for me to pack up and move and such, they gave me a 30 day notice so little time to move with. So I signed the lease, I renewed, I signed the lease with them in 2016. And the lease went from 2016 to 20, this year of 2020. I just received a letter out of nowhere. They told me that they did not want to renew the lease and that they gave me 30 days to leave. And at that time, I nearly just had broke down because again, like I said, I have nowhere to go. I paid my rent every month on time, was never late, never. And for them to send me a 30 day notice like that again, like I said, I'm up against the wall. I don't know what to do, what I'm going to do and nowhere to go. So my cousin introduced me to um, Better Housing for Committee. And I um, called and I got a hold to uh, Grant uh, Kirkpatrick helped me. And um, I told him my story and he said, Miss Parker, you know, we're going to try to get you a little more time in, in the residence. And that's exactly what he did. He asked me how much time did I need to get out of there. And I told him if I can get to like, you know, February, March, he said, well, we got you a November. He got me a November 15th date. And uh, he went back to school. So he also told me that he would be turning the case back over to Frank Avalon. And that's who's helping me now. And he asked me if I would like to participate uh, and tell my story on how, you know, I got here where I am now. So where I am now, I'm, um, I have to November 15th to vacate the premises. I still haven't really found a place yet, but I'm looking every day. I'm looking and I've been making a lot of, making quite a few calls. I haven't got a lot of feedback on a lot of it yet. So I have two daughters and they live in Texas. So they told me, Ma, just come on. So hopefully after the first three years, I'm going to be moving to Texas. Cause I don't even really want to be here, you know, because it's hard for me by myself. You know, I do have a husband, but we're getting ready, you know, kind of part ways. And because of him is the reason I'm still in the house. He has helped me tremendously. Without his help, I probably would have been homeless years ago. So, you know, that's my story now is to just try to come out of the house um, before my time expired, because I do not want to be hit with no evictions and I don't need nothing bad in my records. Cause I have always, all my life paid my own way. I just fell on hard times. And I don't need nothing to hit my records that would hinder me for finding my place once I get to Texas. So that's my plan um, to just move to Texas after the first of the year. Well, thank you, Sharon. I appreciate your sharing your story. And I, I find it just incredible that you've been first your mortgage and then for the past uh, 10 years, you've been paying your rent faithfully. You're still paying your rent faithfully to this day. Yeah. And after 29 years of being in the same house in the same neighborhood, you're suddenly going to pick up and move to Texas. Holy moly. Um, uh, 
it's, it's quite an adjustment. Um, uh, I wonder if others on the panel have any comments. Erica, your, your thought on what you've heard from Sharon? Um, Sharon, first of all, thank you so much for sharing um, your story. Mm -hmm. um, as I was listening to it, um, I'm just going to just be transparent. Rage was filling my body because, like, they stole your house. Like, I just need that to be unequivocally clear to everybody. They stole her house, <laughs> like straight up. And then they had the audacity to make it as she was a bad renter in the house they stole. And I'm just right now, like really overwhelmed by that right there. Um, but that is uh, an example of the type of sickening thing that people are getting away with. And one of the things that I think we need to really gain from this, and even with the Poor People's Campaign, is that what we're talking about right now, these conversations must spread. That these conversations and this education and this information, it must spread into the ears and the eyes, into the hands of the directly impacted because of the fact that this type of predatory behavior it thrives when the people do not understand their power. That is when this type of thing thrives. And I feel like for every story like yours, Sharon, I'm more, I'm even more angry that there's thousands and thousands and thousands of, of more of them. Mm -hmm. That's even more unacceptable. And um, I think that one of the things that really comes from this is what when we have entities like for example i'm i'm dealing with pangea myself and pangea is some of the worst of the worst oh and pangea God. wouldn't even be able to exist if it wasn't for the fact there's no just cause legislation and protection they literally became the conglomerate that they are by kicking people out of homes and buying up all of these properties across the city of chicago on the south and the west side and they prided themselves on it. They bragged about it. They bragged about calling police on people, um, the owners. And this type of cycle of abuse and predatory behavior, it is connected to a cycle of wealth. And that is why we as residents, we as people that are being directly impacted, we have a right to demand that that wealth is distributed properly to make sure that housing is a human right, period because this is not without profit. This is, a, this is a behavior that comes with tremendous amounts of profit. So I want us to also be very clear that there is more than enough money to make sure that what's happening to you, Sharon, never happens to no one, to make sure that all of these residents of Pangea, Pangea is like sharks circling for blood right now. Oh, wow. They cannot wait. You talk, I mean, they tried to bribe me to get me to leave. Like, the, they're circling. They are circling and just waiting to displace tons of people in mass. And we have to be ready on the ground with the people. And I know, I see I see you, Jawanza. I've been out there with Jawanza in the trenches with the people. Like, I know, like, a lot of us, we got, we're executive directors now. We're all of it now. But we, we were, we be with the people. We're with the people. So we know what it's like. And we know who needs to know this. And we know the power once we get out in these streets. And it's time for us to get out in the streets before they put us out in the street. And it's really time for us to really stand up together and demand more because the sharks are circling. The time is really right now for this. Thank you, Erica. And I don't think I swim fast enough to uh, avoid the sharks, but I wanted to um, just be clear that in, in Sharon's situation, um, the passage of Just Cause would have a profound effect. Um, Elite Rentals has never told her the reason they want her to leave. She's done nothing wrong. And yet, uh, Just Cause would then say, nope, you got to give a reason, and it's got to be one of these listed reasons. And if the listed reason is that you want to develop the property and turn it into luxury, whatever, it doesn't stop you necessarily from doing that, except now you have to give way more advanced warning and now you have to pay relocation assistance and we have to make the process much more humane. So when we slow the whole displacement process down, it gives a better transition, it makes things more humane. 
You know, there's there's 600,000 rental units in Chicago, 1.4 million renters, um, and about a third of those, uh, close to 200,000 of those rentals are in smaller buildings of six or fewer units. And so um, uh, we've heard a lot so far from Erica and the aldermen about a bigger moneyed interest, but there's also a lot of smaller landlords in our community that um, our, our homeowners and contributing members. And I wonder if William would give us some insight about uh, what you think the impact of Just Cause would be on your business and would it be a major departure from what you already do or, or, or something more minor? Hello, so can you finally hear me? Yes. Okay, finally. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is William. Uh, I'm a small mom and pop landlord in Humble Park as well as in Norwood Park on the Northwest side. Um, so, you know, I support the Just Cause simply because, you know, it codifies what many, many small two, three flat uh, landlords are already doing, the mom and pops, those that uh, rent to their family, those that rent to the friends of the family, those that have a vested interest in uh, keeping tenants uh, for the long term. I've owned buildings for 17 two buildings for about 17 years. And I have tenants in my building that have been with me for 16 years, 15 years. Uh, my second building is only, uh, it just had its first full vacancy in nine years. So like when we talk about just cause ordinance, allowing it truly like codifies this idea of being able to stay in place and centering the tenants. And so I think that, um, you know, it's, it's good policy in general. It's just good policy. It, it disincentivizes landlords, particularly corporate landlords, but even all landlords, let's just say all landlords from uh, terminating the lease or going through the eviction process to profit off the displacement of our neighbors and, on our, and our friends. So that's why I support uh, this legislation. And, um, you know, I, I know other small landlords and you know, I use the opportunity and that, and that um, opportunity to talk to folks and, and try to like help frame that it's really about the tenants and centering the tenants. Well, thank you, William. And I think we all appreciate that uh, centering your business around the people because being a landlord is after all and ought to be a people business. If you're not interested in people, you should, should be in that business. Um, so we certainly appreciate your, your, your effort there. Long-term stability is the name of the game that we're trying to embed into the law. I should mention that um, the lion's share of landlord-tenant relationships, not only here in Chicago, but nationwide, are oral month-to-month -month agreements um, that traditionally could have been terminated on just a mere 30 days notice for, for no reason. So there's whole swatches of people here in our community, tens of thousands of people. Um, that need this uh, protection of having a legitimate listed reason with appropriate notice and in certain instances, uh, relocation assistance. Um, it, that prompts me to then ask John Bartlett um, to not only reflect on what you've heard here tonight, John, but to uh, give us a sense. You run the citywide hotline that gets tens of thousands of calls from renters every single year. And you also go out with your crew and organize uh, buildings of renters. So what do you think uh, just the effect of Just Cause would be on what you're seeing there at MTO through your helpline? Um, well, first, I, I think what it'll help to do is to really start balancing the power between landlords and tenants a bit. Because as uh, Ms. Parker was saying, to hold your housing over you as a club to say, I'm going to throw you out. What more can you do to somebody? You know, it's like, it's terrifying. It creates terror. So when you have somebody being terrified, what's the first thing that they're not going to be kind of necessarily challenging you to ask for repairs, to do other things. And, and that's what we see actually is that just causes, you know, I think going to help balance that power out a little bit. In fact, one of the tenants we'd asked, if she wanted to come on and talk about her situation, she was afraid to because the landlord might hear her talking and then she might get a 30 day notice and lose her home. And she said, I can't do that right now, especially in this time of COVID. Who, you know, 
how can you risk your home at this? Because, you know, the home is what is kind of your, the base point, you know, it's what's, you know, keeping everybody healthy and all this, because you have a place to go. Do you have your uh, place? And so I, I think that, you know, that just cause is going to go a long way to balancing the power so that landlords can't just evict you for complaining. And there are a lot of tenants that are afraid to say, oh, my ceiling's about to fall in, but they're afraid to tell their landlord because they think I might get an eviction notice for this. Or that they're afraid to say what's actually going on. You know, there's lots of repairs. So, you know, I think for one, a just cause is really gonna help people to kind of stand up to give them actually the kind of the basis and the support they need to stand up to actually get, make sure that the landlord is fulfilling their part of the bargain instead of them having to like, oh, please, my, my uh, sink is leaking and you know, can you fix it and please don't evict me. I mean, th this is the kind of situation that we're also, that we're dealing with. And that, you know, I think it also really, it does get into, you know, there's still a lot of discrimination that happens. Landlords decide, oh, I don't like your kids. I want you to move. They found that, in fact, that uh, in, uh, I think, what's his name, Matt, um, De De Matthew Desmond came up and said, the, the people that are most at threat of being evicted are families with children. And that is really, to me, outrageous that landlords don't want kids in there and they continually threaten them and try to force them to, you know, to move, to get out or, you know, or to keep their kids like so that they can't be kids, you can't go run around, you can't go outside, you can't do anything. So I, I think there's some of that. And I think then finally, you know, just I think everybody's alluded to about the eviction cliff that's coming up that you know, what we don't need is for landlords to just be using the threat of eviction and all this just piling on to, to you know, to kind of make tenants feel trapped. And I think it does get down into what um, I believe Erica was talking about is about housing is a human right. And what does that mean? You know, first, you know, I think it means that you have to be affordable. It is not affordable. And right now our rents are not affordable. I mean, what 20% of the population is paying half their income to rent. And they're struggling to do that because they know how important a roof is over their head. Secondly, that it needs to be decent. There is no one should have to live in conditions where there's mold growing on their wall, the ceilings are about to cave in. That needs to be decent. And last, you know, the other part, it needs to be stable. You need to have some sort of thinking that I'm going to be able to stay here as this rug isn't going to be just pulled out from under me. If we don't have those three things, you know, then housing's not a right because then you're always at risk of something or you're at, and that. So I would say that, you know, just cause, you know, to me is part of a broader package that we really need to make housing a human right so that everybody has a home. So it'll help with the stability, but you know, we need things like rent control. We need things like proactive inspections so that people aren't living in slums or so that people aren't you know, paying half their income to rent. So we really need, you know, I think of it as a broad package, a broad array of what we need to be doing to, in order to make housing a human right. Well, thank you, John, and um, certainly the, whatever the, the components of housing as a human right might be, the top component is that sense that you can stay in place and lay down roots absent your own bad behavior. Um, that security of being in place is the top element of housing as a human right. You know, sometimes decision makers, in, in whether it's in City Hall or in the media or in the industry, talk about renters as an object and ignore the fact that we're really talking about individual human beings and, and, and the lives of human beings. And, and with that, I want, I see that Geneva has been able to link back with us here. And so I want to give her an opportunity to, to share what happened with her. So uh, Geneva, say hi to the folks and uh, tell, them, tell them your story. Here. Geneva, you have to you unmute yourself you. by hitting your space bar, or there you go. Okay. 
sorry. Go ahead. Um, hi, everyone. I uh, am so sorry about the instability of my connection here. I keep going in and out. So I hope it lasts long enough for me to tell you my story. So um, I, again, want to thank you for inviting me to share my story with you. I still have my 22 year old grandson's sippy cup and his sister's baby shoes. Mine is the home where everyone gathers for holidays. It is important and that is why I have always tried to protect it. As with most people, my shelter, my home is central to my well being and indeed my very existence. My situation began insidiously. A new owner purchased our condo. So I was happy when he offered us a lease. Things went relatively well for the first several years, except that he didn't cash our rent checks on time. So when a whole month went by and he didn't cash our check, I wasn't, uh, I was a bit worried, but not nearly as worried as I might have been had that not been his habit. Nevertheless, I called him uh, about it and left a message, but he did not return my call. The next month, when the rent check was not cashed, I called the owner, left another message, but again, no response. When he did not cash the check for the third month, I really started to worry. I called our homeowners association they investigated and said that the bank had recovered the property. Now I was in full blown panic mode. We were told that in the interim, we had to pay the homeowners association. So we did. Next, we got a note from someone who told us that she represented a company that represented the bank. She said we would probably have to move, but that we could pay to stay there until she heard back from her boss. The next note we got asked us to leave in two weeks and that they would pay us $2,600 to do so. Of course, these days owners want the first and last month's rent. That coupled with the cost of moving would have far exceeded that amount of money uh, that they were offering, uh, even if we were inclined to move and we were not. I'd never been in a situation like that and I was terrified. I was literally getting physically ill. My son got sick and I had to go to Maryland. When I returned home, there was a huge eviction notice on my door left by the Cook County Sheriff. I could barely breathe. I worked for 51 years and now I'm an older adult living on a small fixed income and not in the best of health. My daughter had been laid off from her job. My son was sick and now I was being evicted from our home where we had paid rent without ever missing for 25 years to the tune of roughly $660,000, nearly three quarters of a million dollars without ever missing a single month. At that point, I was terrified that I might find myself in a homeless shelter and all of the important things like my photos and my grandson's sippy cup would be lost. Those things meant nothing to anyone else, but to me, they were everything. In the ensuing weeks, we got letter after letter offering money for us to leave a visit from Chicago Social Services to prevent eviction, visits to the courthouse. We sought help from our church. We were advised to stop paying our homeowners association, then later advised to start paying some other company reportedly appointed by the bank, which we did. But after a few weeks, they sent the money back to us, advising us that they were no longer involved. Every day was another nightmarish and confusing experience. Having your shelter threatened, as many of you have said today, is one of the most physically and emotionally challenging experiences anyone could ever have. 
the threat of being homeless and losing all of your possessions. I was plagued with nagging thoughts. Where will I go? How will I eat? How can I be safe? My very survival was threatened, not just every day, but every single moment. I could think of nothing else. Thankfully, I was able to get free legal help. Had it not been for that, I'm not sure I would be here to share my story today. I really hope that it will help others and shed light on the situation uh, that was an incredibly threatening and horrific time for me. Thank you so much uh, for listening. Well, thank you, Geneva, for sharing your story. And um, I'll, I'll just say that uh, Geneva's eviction case was dismissed. And um, through lots of effort, negotiation, and, and lawsuit, um, she was able to stay in her home of over 20 years. So uh, thank goodness. But uh, goodness gracious, everything that you had to go through in all that time. I think you told me before, Janita, that you had four or five different companies contacting you in contradiction of one another. You didn't even know who you were supposed to interact with. Good Lord. Um, well, we're, we're getting on in the hour and, and we've actually reached our time, but I do want to spend uh, just a couple minutes giving um, our panelists an opportunity to give a quick uh, sort of last minute thought to, to what they've heard. Uh, please, just about 30 seconds each, Byron, why don't we start with you? Yes, and just briefly, I think that um, just the urgency of passing legislation like Just Cause, the urgency for us as public officials to listen to our constituents, listen to the most vulnerable, listen to the reality of our communities. That's how we're gonna address the many issues that we have, including violence and, and the many systemic issues that we have is by bringing relief, bringing good legislation to prevent more suffering, to prevent evictions in our most vulnerable communities. We are in a pandemic. We need to make sure that we protect the most vulnerable or public health for everyone is about protecting lives. So thank you again for, for putting together this important conversation. Thank you, Byron. William, any final thoughts or comments from you? I just wanna say that I'm so thankful to um, hear the stories of uh, folks here and the tenants. It really um, helps me understand the interpersonal uh, dynamics and the power dynamics that come to play with being a landlord and working with uh, tenants. And um, ultimately it, it, your stories have helped, are helping shape me and how I can be a better better uh, landlord <clears throat> and uh, to work with my tenants. So thanks. Thank you, William. John Bartlett, final thoughts? Oh, I just think that we need to be pressing our, the, our aldermen and all that to really pass this and pass this now it's needed. And, you know, during a time of budget crisis it doesn't even cost anything, it does not cost the city a penny to institute this. So there's no reason except, you know, you know, because they're beholden to the landlords. So let's pass just cause. Thank you, Erica, final thoughts. Yeah, um, first and foremost, I just want to thank uh, Ms. Sharon Parker and Geneva Norman again for sharing your um, incredible stories. Um, it is so necessary that those stories are heard and known, um, and it's an important part of this work, probably one of the most important parts, to be honest, um, because without this real testimony, um, we wouldn't even know what's happening to our people a lot of times. Um, it's meant to be a secret. Um, and I thank you all for breaking that silence. Um, and I will just say, um, just in closing, uh, this is a, a step, as, as it was said earlier, towards housing being a human right. Um, this provides a breath for some of our people. And that, and that moment of breath is where we can really begin to organize power amongst the people, because this is an issue that will not ever truly be resolved and truly get to the goal of housing as a human right without the everyday people knowing that they are equipped and that they truly hold the power in their hands. And so it starts with conversations like this, the work that you're doing, Frank, is incredible. Um, and everyone here on this panel, I just wanna thank you all for allowing me to be here today with you, thank you. 
Well, thank you, Erica. Juanza, final thoughts? Sure, I, I just wanted to say that the stories that Sharon and Geneva shared, it just, it's just a travesty uh, that this happens in our communities in this country. Uh, I want to share that, unfortunately, uh, the stories that we just heard are like the beginning drops uh, for the rainstorm that we know is coming. Uh, we see the dark clouds. We feel the temperature change. We feel the wind shift. Uh, the Wall Street Journal uh, released a story saying that investors are raising hundreds of millions of dollars to implement programs that almost cost uh, Geneva and Sharon their homes. They are right now raising money to be able to go in and offer homeowners the opportunity to sell their homes to be able to turn around and then pay them rent. The only reason why that's a scheme that they're literally able to raise hundreds of millions of dollars to implement is because there is no regulation on rent. And so just as we need just cause, we also need rent control. If there was not the unlimited, infinite profit potential in renting, they would not be forcing people out of their homes. And again, it's only because whatever it is they pay to purchase the home, they know that they're going to make three, four, five times over by making them pay rent over time because they can increase it at any point they want to. And so we aren't dealing with people who care about people. We're dealing with people who only care about profit and the ability to make a return on their investment. So we have to fight and we have to fight viciously because they don't care. They are just as willing to force us out of our homes um, at the potential uh, ability to make a couple of dollars. So again, thank you, Frank, for what you're doing. Thank you to everybody uh, who participated tonight. Uh, I wish you all the best. Uh, Ms. Parker, I hope you land well. Uh, it's, it's just, again, it's a shame uh, that this has to happen. And congratulations to you, Geneva. Well, thank you, Jones. I appreciate your thoughts. And um, I want to say in closing again, thank you, uh, Sharon. Thank you, Geneva, for sharing your stories with us. I'd like to certainly uh, thank our panelists, uh, not only for spending time with us tonight, but for the work that you do. Bill, thank you for being the landlord that you are. Juanzo, Alderman Sicho Lopez, Erica, John Bartlett, thank you all for, for, for being um, uh, leaders for uh, us all, uh, not only in this time, but throughout the time that you've been doing this important work. I'd like to give a shout out to Alex Escobedo of uh, Lawyers Committee for Better Housing, who helped us put together this program and is particularly good about making all this technology work for all of us. So uh, thank you, Alex. And I wanna sign off by saying, join this campaign. Just Cause for Eviction is a fight worth having and it's a fight worth joining in on. Even if you can only spend a few minutes doing phone banking once in a blue moon, that helps. You wanna give your testimony to city council, maybe help with the news media, maybe talk to some friends and relatives to help out. Here's all you gotta do. Go to www.justcausechicago.org, click the link, sign up, and we'll get back to you and find a way that you feel comfortable with plugging into this campaign. So good night, stay safe everybody. And uh, for you in the audience, we'll see you next Thursday at Tenant Thursdays from Lawyers Committee for Better Housing. Enjoy Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Thank you, everyone. Have a great weekend. Bye. 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 Bye.